I'll set it up. Uh, okay. All right, I, I think it's good enough. Okay, so today we'll be talking about computer vision, especially with convolutional neural networks, which uh, I'm pretty sure most of you have heard of. Uh, this is a very interesting topic, one of my favorites actually. And then some of the deep learning and, and um, ML specialists would actually argue that um, computer vision CV is actually what pushed um, deep learning forward and like is the driving motivational force behind most of it. And um, again, my name is Frank, and this is Jay, and today we'll be teaching you guys. So here's today's objectives uh, that we would like to cover. So first, why do we even have this concept of CNN? When, why is that even useful? And then we'll talk through uh, some 2D CNN introduction, which is just how to classify some basic images in two dimensional. And then we'll talk about the different parts of it, such as the convolutional layer, which is the main focus, and how we can uh, use hyperparameters to make different convolutional layers. And then we'll also talk about pooling layer, which is a technique that is often used with convolutional layers to make uh, image processing easier and uh, training uh, faster. And then we'll, in the end, we'll close off with some history and ethics regarding this technology. So first, let's talk about some pitfalls with feed forward uh, deep neural networks, which we have uh, learned already. Just those with uh, neurons and then connecting to another layer of neurons with no uh, special layer in between. So. When we actually want to classify 2D images, we, uh, we need to remember that feed forward neural networks only takes in a uh, row vector or a column vector, however you want to think it, uh, like x times one dimensional array. And then we try to process that kind of data by push, pushing it into a neural network layer. So if we want to process something 2D, like a square image, then we actually need to flatten it. And flatten, we, I just mean that take the first row and then take the second row, connect at the end of the uh, first row, then we make a huge line. And uh, what happens when 2D images are flattened is that um, it becomes very hard to see what it actually is. So let's, um, this is a game that I also showed uh, students from last quarter. So let's try to see if you can recognize these images. So first, what do you guys think this is? You guys are very smart. Um, this is an example of flattening. So we can see I just cut off some images and then put it in a row. And this is pretty easy to recognize. And uh, this is a bit um, not accurate because it, uh, actual flattening will be like one pixel in a row. Instead, this is like a couple pixels because I was too lazy to cut it off. Um, but then how about this one? If you recognize this, you're actually cheating. <laughs> okay, maybe. Any other ideas? Pardon? Okay. So, well, the answer is you should not be able to recognize it, and it's a car. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we would want, uh, ideally, for some um, deep learning uh, models to be able to recognize these things. So we can't just flatten it because even we can't recognize it. And we'll talk about the reasons why we can't visually recognize it later. But the same difficulty that we have, uh, machines also suffer from. So here's a, let's just rearrange the problem. So once we flatten an image, so suppose that three by three matrix is the image and we flatten it into a, a column vector. Uh, this does not work for most images. Simple images as in like literally, like maybe the strawberry image they can classify and then maybe like uh, MNIST, which is the, uh, the uh, like the number images, uh, the digit from zero to nine, that can be trained to be pretty accurate, but most of the times it is not useful. You're not doing this guy. Huh? Wait, <laughs> I thought it was so Okay, hold on. Okay, so uh, let's first about talk about one of the difficulties, uh, which is translational invariance. Um, when we look at images, we try to find out features, right? When we see, like, say, I look at this classroom, I see that there's many people and maybe tables and chairs. But if I look to the left, like, one degrees, it doesn't change what I see because my focus is still on the same thing, and then just moving it by one centimeter doesn't change anything that much. So if you look at these two owl images, they're uh, trans uh, they're translated just like to the right a bit, but then there's not really like an actual like um, noticeable difference for human eye because we can always recognize the owl. But then if we try to somehow 
flatten this matrix image. Let's just suppose that this L image is made out of like four by four matrix with this kind of data. We in Bradley is not, but um, say that you can see the first one uh, starts with like seven, seven, eight, three, but the next one is different, but it's translated to the right a bit. The three IDs look pretty similar, but if we flatten these things, they actually look very different. And then if we try to train neural networks, it doesn't really work because uh, say the first neuron would uh, suppose uh, we want to look at uh, want to see seven and then say that it might be a part of the owl but if we move the image right by one pixel then that value changes quite a lot so from like uh, seven to three so if you ch uh, train a neural network based on just flattening the image and trying to find features in the flattened version of the image then we can't truly capture the feature of the image instead of we're trying to remember what pixels are at which position in the flattened vector and this is why the, uh, we need some sort of model that has translational invariance so that we can um, train on images that might be tra uh, translated or some images features that's part of the image but not the entire image say like a small owl in the corner of the image we also want to be able to classify that so our approach to this is trying to restore this to information locality we want to build a like, neural network that recognizes the spatial relationships that, uh, within the image instead of like processing every pixel value of the image equally like indiscriminately. So that's why we like, would propose convolutional neural network as a solution. And yeah, let's move on to the details. Yes. So I can hear. Oh, okay. So what I was saying that uh, we need to address this information locality by proposing a data structure, a uh, uh, neural network structure that recognizes spatial relationships between pixels. And okay, so we are going to the details of that. And as a recap, uh, we already know that between the input of and output of the neural network, we have a lot of a bunch of hidden layers, and I speak into the mic. Okay, and each of them is combined. Okay, each of them is a combination of linear layer, and which is responsible for the matrix operation, and also an activation layer, which is like adds non-linear arity into it. And we also have a softmax layer that is added upon the, the end of the final linear layer. And here we are going to introduce another two layers. And the first one is the convolutional layer, which by its name you know that is the major deal of this network. And a rough sketch of it is that it uses kernels um, to reveal features of the input by scanning through pixels in the image and produce a feature map. So that doesn't make a lot of sense, but we're going to like explain that. And a, mm, a feature of it is it uses admin wise dot product between the kernel and the input image, and it can recognize like spatial relationships within the image. And here we are going to do a short demo of how this convolutional things work. And yeah, um, yeah, this is just a like, showcase of how kernel moves through the image, and we are going to demo that step by step. By step. And okay, so we again has this owl, and it is represented by a four by four like pixel matrix, and we are going to have a kernel, which is another matrix. Uh, we can specify how many rows it has, how many columns, and how it moves across the image. And these are called hyperparameters in our deep learning like neural network. And what it's going to actually learn is the weights within the matrix, like every individual values within it. And they, and they are probably going to be learned through gradient descent, like, like how we do that in the deep learning in like neural networks. Okay, so first, um, we're going to overlap our kernel with the top left corner of our input image. And we are going to multiply every element in the kernel with the element below it. 
as you see that we multiply 0.2 by 7 and 0.5 by 5, and we are going to sum it together. And that is going to be the first row, which is the zero index, uh, zeros row, and the zeros column value of our output matrix. And we're going to move our kernel rightwards by one unit. And we're do, doing the same thing again, multiplying every element by the element in, in, the, in the input matrix and summing them together to get the second one, which is the zeros row and the first column. And we probably want to move our kernel rightwards by one more unit, but uh, we're not going to do that because if we do so, we cannot match the like the last column of the kernel with any number. So that is invalid unless we have padding, which we are going to discuss later. So we are going to move to the next row. And we are basically doing the same thing. Again, and finally, we are moving to the last row and the last column. And we got the output. And this output is a somewhat abstract description towards the original input matrix. And uh, the number doesn't tell a lot of things, but you can basically see, see like the upper two rows have a relatively big number, and the last row has a little small, smaller number. And if you do that to the image of a little like uh, tr translated out that we saw like previously, it will probably result into a similar matrix that identifies with a uh, like similar feature of it. So that is how we are transforming the original data into some kind of feature. Okay, so any question on this on this demo? Um, yes, like in terms of bias, uh, in terms of bias, we usually are talking about bias for different data points, but since it is a single data point, I think uh, the information is processed somewhat equally, but yeah, probably the data in the middle will get noticed a little more, but it doesn't create a lot of influence on our result. Yeah, so if you think about how this uh, filter is translated through this entire image, you'll notice that every pixel, except for the border pixels, are looked at the same number of times. So yes, it's true that the outer pixels will be looked at one less because, like, say if you want to center a filter on a pixel, like the, the outer pixels won't be able to fit a kernel in the center because there's nothing outside of it, right? And uh, that is true. But we often don't have that uh, much training problems with it because of the fact that it's on the border of the image. So it's less likely that the object's uh, on the border. And we also have techniques that expand the image so that we can put a kernel on top of the outer pixels. That will also alleviate some problems. Yes. But yeah, it is totally true that if we do it this way, that the middle ones will be considered more. Yeah, if you want really some focus on the edges of the image, you can probably do some padding, which are, we are going to cover. And this is a like mathematical, like formatted representation of what we did. It is called a discrete cross correlation, but as you can imagine, we are not very strict with the terms. Like in mathematics, we have the convolution operator and the correlation operator. They are actually they have an inverse relationship, but somehow like in deep learning, we refer to convolution as the correlation operator. And yes, just something to notice. And we are doing discrete, so there's nothing about calculus here. And yeah, it's, it's just a like summation of like uh, of a lot of downwise products. Yeah. And um, you might be wondering like what kind of feature can our kernel extract? And the thing is, for our deep learning models, uh, we don't have a lot of clear 
uh, like clearly curated kernels that's shown here because the kernels are learned by the, by the model itself. But some kind of um, kernels like we can use for not deep learning, just basic image processing includes identity, which is doing nothing to a picture by putting a one in the middle and all zeros for else. And rich detection, which is like weakening the surrounding and the, focusing on the like the center center pixel of the, of the current when what of what the kernel is looking at, and an, another examples include like sharpening and blurring. Okay. And then we can make some connections um, for our like convolutional neural network with our with our primal brain, and. The first thing is we can say that convolutional neural network is basically inspired by our visual system. And uh, in our visual system, there are uh, two types of cells. Uh, one is called the simple cell. Uh, it's, um, it responded most strongly for features as, at a very particular like spatial lo location. So that is like how our convolutional layer functions. It only looks at a particular like location of an image and processes it. And our like kernel moving from the top to the bottom of the image is like a lot of simple cells looking at different locations and gathering features from them. And we also have complex cells, which is mm, which is kind of like uh they process inputs indiscriminately so that uh, you don't get a lot of variance across the different locations. So it's like linear layer uh, in case that we are doing a fully, connect, fully connected layer. Okay. And we also see that there, is, there are different parts within the visual system just like how we have different layers for our neural network. Uh, for example, we have the primary primary visual cortex for edge detection and line detection. And we have V2 that moves forward this process by like uh, recognizing the shapes. And there are also V4 responsible for like identifying the objects. It's, it's like how our convolutional neural network um, process certain small features first and then move forward to the like whole abstract state of our like image. And this is just another um, diagram for like comparing our brain and the, our, and the CNN. You can see that uh, the left parts are are responsible for the basic functions, and the, the right parts are more responsible for the abstract ones. Okay, so any questions on this? Okay. If not, I think we can go into some technical details on how we specify each convolutional layer. Okay, so uh, we talked a lot about um, different words and the ter terminologies that um, is quite hard to define, and some pe people use it interchangeably, just because they aren't like put in the Oxford Dictionary for researchers to look at. So here are some of the terms that you may see if you are uh, going to study CNN a bit more or read some papers. So number one is a kernel. It's a matrix that extracts features from an input. So uh, this is uh, no different from a filter. So a kernel would be something like just a uh, m by m. Well, they could be equal, uh, often equal, actually. So M by M matrix. Yeah, it's a single that, matrix. Yeah, they uh, kind of iterate through the image, uh, as we've seen before, like go from the top to the left and all the way to the right and then down to the right. That matrix itself is called a kernel. And then so uh, size is the dimension of the kernel, pretty self-explanatory. And then there's also a number of input channels. Um, this is um, easy to actually implement, but pretty hard to get your brain around because that uh, images are actually RGB numbers. 
when we look at it, it's a 2D dimen uh, two, it kind of looks like a 2D um, data, but it's actually 3D with um, 3 depth because it has RGB fields. And that's why uh, we have to consider the feature of input channels. So for a normal input image, we'll have, say, m by m size of the image, and then also a number of channels, usually three for RGB. There are also other image encoding techniques that's used that has different number of um, channels, but mostly we focus on using RGB because that's the most common uh, way to encode an image. And then here's what uh, when the filter comes in. So uh, in order to actually go through all the channels of the image, so for example, RGB channels, uh, we actually need to put a kernel on every layer of the image. So for example, we might have a kernel just for, just for the red part of the image, and we have another kernel that has different weights for the green part and the blue part. And all these will be trained independently. Um, you could also try to make them the same kernel, and then um, just use it on the same uh, use the same kernel and the iterate through three layers. That could also work, but um, that's kind of uh, the architectural design that you would need to decide on to see which one works the best. But in general, filter is just a collection of uh, kernels. And yeah, filters can also um, arise from not just the input channels because when you um, iterate a kernel through an image and convolve into another matrix you could also introduce more channels into it. So for example, you can have a input image that's m by m, that's three channels, and then you can have, uh, say, three kernels, that's one filter, that iterates through all of them, that yields another matrix that's three channels. But then you can say, okay, in the same layer, I also want to do another filter, and then iterate through all of them. Then you have another three channels. Then in the end, this, the output in this layer, you have six channels. And then you also have to take that into account when you train for the next layer. So you could kind of make uh, artificial channels just by applying more filters. And then those are all hyperparameters that you have to manage in the model. And that's pretty hard to optimize. And then, so yeah, number of output channels is the number of output channels that the filter will um, generate. Uh, so like, uh, as I talked about before, the input channel could be different and the output channel could be something that's dependent on your filter. And then here are some more hyperparameters that we um, use when we are actually controlling how the image, uh, how the kernel convolve over the image. So one is the stride, which is a step with the kernel. So uh, before we saw an example of uh, convolving an image with a three by three matrix, that was uh, using a uh, stride of one, which is the default. So you convolve um, based on every pixel. So you put the pixel center on the top left as much as possible. Then you go to the next one, next one, iterate. But then uh, we could also say, okay, step twice um, every time you um, try to go to the next uh, pixels. Or you could say go to uh, three times or so forth. And then uh, padding, which we briefly touched on before, is what the technique used to actually add artificial t pixels to the, to the image, which can solve one of the problems that um, or he asked about how you can, how the middle pixels are focused more uh, and convolved more in the iteration of the kernel because of the fact that it's in its uh, center and outer uh, pixels are not touched as much just because it, the kernels don't fit there. So you could fix that by just adding more padding. Say like you have a three by three matrix, it won't fit in the top left, um, left, top left uh, pixel just because it has no outer pixels. But you could say, okay, I added just another outer layer of zeros just so that I can fit my kernel onto the actual top left uh, pixel of the image. And that will change how your output size look and how your matrix um, input and output for every layer will look. And there's a general formula for that um, that is pretty hard to remember. But in general, if you're actually using PyTorch, you can just kind of uh, brute force your way there. Like you can apply one layer and then you put the hyperparameters in and you can just compute it and then put dot shape to see what the shape actually is instead of having to calculate it. So that's one technique that you should use in your technical project. And yeah, that's the formula. I don't even remember it because I don't want to, but that's a formula. Um, uh, yeah, just as a side note that we see uh, the stride and padding are specified as a tuple, which has two numbers. Uh, actually, you can do one, and if you just specify one number, it's, it is default to like the for the same for row and column movement or like padding and if you specify two you can do differently on row and columns. 
Yeah, and this is another layer that's completely different from the convolutional layer, but they pretty much come together because they use to solve the same uh, uh, like convolutional neural network problem. So it's called the pooling layer, and it's often applied um, basically directly after the convolutional layer. And then what they do is they kind of summarize um, and shrink your matrix or image if it's the at like well you wouldn't really apply to the input. So we basically try to uh, summarize features that you generated from convolving over a Im image. So they don't have any ways to learn; they're just basically an operation. So um, they introduce sparseness by reducing dimensionality for feature maps because they shrink your matrix. And then there's different types of pooling, like max, average. And usually you want these to be pretty simple operations, just because when you uh, back crawl from the loss, you don't want something super complex that's like going to mess up your gradient or anything. So usually you would do max, average. And max is pretty much the industry standard. Um, so here on the right, you can see uh, the example of max pooling. Basically, you specify like the size of how much you pull into one pixel. So for example, this one, the top left four pixels, one, one, five, six, are uh, have a max pooling applied to them. And then in the output of the max pool, you just get six because that's the biggest pixel in this area. And then you do that for other areas as well. And what this does is um, it down samples the data because uh, what well, you're going from a four by four to a two by two. And then also prevents overfitting because sometimes um, you probably don't need all the detailed data in all the features. Because say like um, is you can't really visualize it because it's in, in a network already. But you can imagine like say if you want to try to classify a person, uh, whether or not they're wearing a hat might not be super important to you. So you might want to uh, classify the features as the largest, and that's why you do a max pool. And then so this prevents overfitting. So maybe like if the network sees someone without a hat, then it might say okay, this is not a person because it's not wearing a hat. If your images all had person with a hat. But then if you do max pool, it might actually recognize the model properly and generalize better. And then this also helps with translational invariance just because it doesn't matter where the largest number is in those four pixels. Uh, say the six could be at the top left, but after you max pool, it will still be six outputted to the output matrix. And that also helps with that. And then just uh, downsampling the data and then having less matrix to calculate and backprop for also just makes the computational time way faster. Okay, so for now we are going to see how uh, the convolutional layer and pooling layer are fit into the full sequence of how our model process uh, like a data point. So in this case, um, we're having probably an MNIST data point, which is just a 28 by 28 image of a number. And we are putting it into a convolutional layer, and we are using a 5 by 5 kernel uh, with valid padding, by valid padding, it usually means like zero padding. So because it's zero padding, uh, you don't have the original data size, so it's going to be 24 by 24. And there is, and if you see um, below the N1 channels text, it says that it is 24 by 24 by N1, and this N1 is the specification, specification of how many output channels it has. Like, and that is saying how many filters you apply it to. And it's going through a max pooling layer uh, with two by two <coughs> sides. And th so the result would be 12 by 12 by N1. And then it's going to through another uh, convolutional layer. Usually the first layer is kind of simple because it's just extracting some basic feature of the image, and the second convolutional layer can be pretty complex. Um, in this case, it's applying a lot more channels than the first one um, by stacking more like filters. And it's also using a 5x5 five five kernel with zero padding and doing this next pooling again. And finally, we got a, a pile of channels, and this cha um, these channels represent a single data point this single number two. And it's going to be flattened into a linear layer. And we apply something like softmax and to reach the output of how the model thinks the, which number it is. And this is this is the like code implementation of the model. Uh, you don't worry, need to worry about details like it's only mm, specifying some cons constants and putting those constants, fitting this those into the uh, 
the each layer, and、mm, we can focus on the like the composition of the layer. So it is first a com two D, which is the convolutional layer, and then a ReLU. It is not shown on the、uh, on the diagram, but usually you will have an activation layer, like behind your convolutional layer, and then you are applying a max pooling two D. And another convolutional two D and value and next two D, and finally you are going to flatten that and feed it through by linear layer and get the output. Okay. Any questions on this? Can see that again. Yeah, you can. Yeah, totally. It it would just be another dimension. So like instead of say、uh, convolving over a two D image like that, you would like kind of convolve over three D spaces with three D kernels. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. I'm pretty sure there's more optimization methods that、yeah, would work better for two D models. Python has a separate API for three D convolution. Yeah, like you see, this is comp two D. So there's like different like underlying implementation for three D, but the general idea is the same. It will also work for like time series data. So like if you have a video of like basically images every like frame, you could also do that、um, using convolutional neural networks, just、uh, specifying time as like another dimension. That will also work. Does that answer your question? Yes. Convolutional neural networks can also be useful for temporal relation temporal relationships. That is not only spatial but also like it can detect relationships between pixels across time. And if you want more visualization of the convolutional neural networks, you can go to this website. It's a CNN explainer, and it got a lot of cool diagrams there.、Okay. And we're going to move to the final part of this presentation. And we're first going to reveal the history of like computer vision and convolutional neural networks. And、um, so before the like. The usage of convolutional neural network. There are a few other attempts to、uh, model how our vision system works. One of them is a、uh, new cognitron, and yeah. But convolutional neural networks later become like the mainstream op option for processing images, and this is like example of an early use of convolution in like. For process modeling, handwritten zip codes, like to trying to recognize like those、uh, string of numbers by using back propagation with the、uh, convolutional layer involved, and、uh, like convolutional ne neural networks can be very data hungry. That is, it is、um, actually a little more supervised. Than the traditional deep learning neural networks, and there are datasets created for them. And famous example is the ImageNet, which consists of over forty million images, and they have been tagged with more than twenty thousand classes. And it becomes very handy if you want to train、uh, like some heavy neural networks. We are also going to encounter CFAR.、Uh, if you are going to do the tech project, it's another、mm, dataset that consists of about like, also like tens of millions of pictures, and it is tagged、mm, by with ten、uh, or a hundred categories according to the datasets you choose, and it will be a lot. It will be very useful if you want to do like image classification. And an example of the modern、uh, convolutional neural network is this AlexNet, and it came out、uh, in twenty and twenty fifteen. And as you can see, it is a like giant network, not compared to today's like billion scale networks, but it has sixteen million param parameters, and it has a lot of like complex techniques and under. By instructors, we said like overlapping pooling, which is you are not going by the default stride. You are going, for example, if you have a two by two pooling 
like putting kernel, and you usually will move it two unit once. But if you are doing like overlapping fully, you probably want to move it one unit each time. And this is also an option which is realized in LXNet. And there are also techniques like dropout and ensemble. If you're interested, we can talk about them later in the lecture, but yes. Finally, we're just going to mm. talk about some ethics. Yeah, so um, as you all know, um, AI can do some pretty intense stuff and they are widely used in our lives. Like the, the, the one of the networks we just actually showed was, is still used in the USPS zip code recognition. And then there's also a lot of facial recognition um, like on your iPhones and everything. And then there's also ChatGPT, I'm pretty sure a lot of you use. And then there can be a lot of bias and discrimination uh, in those data sets and the models that are created by them. So um, if you see, uh, see images like these, it's, it's very uh, possible that the data you collected is actually not representative and has some sort of bias included into it. And then if you're not careful with what data you collect and how you train it, you could train some super like discriminative uh, model that well could hurt others. So um, is, um, and then in my opinion, um, I don't know if everyone will think this way, but it is not enough to say the data did it because, well, technically you just wrote the model and the data and the model train itself. But I think it's part of your job to actually know that the data has to be somewhat representative and somehow um, not discriminative to like a, some sort of population in order to actually make it um, a good AI model. So um, please be careful when you're actually uh, implementing models with uh, some random data you gathered. I think most data sets like uh, Cypher will have uh, some sort of uh, guidelines with to how they uh, gather their data. But if you're gathering data for yourself or using some sort of data set that's unknown on Kaggle, please be careful with the model you train and see some biases into it. And lastly, yeah, privacy concerns with data collection and classification is also very important. Um, like don't go random take photos of other people just to collect data. And then, yeah, uh, try to not apply AI models to where it is not should be applied to. And all those things um, are, pretty, um, are pretty hard to uh, distinguish what's good or bad because it's so new, there's not that much legislation around it. So please just like, depend on your moral compass uh, to do what the right thing is when you're trying to train a model. Yeah, so just like you said, we should be careful of what we think are biases and what the, like the data that's like gathered from those medias represent. Is that what you mean? That's actually, I think, part of the, the reading that you're going to do in this assignment uh, about how um, supervised learning, which is uh, what CNN is part of, actually requires a lot of effort to label data and a lot of correctness when labeling data, say like what image is what, and then not just like these easy images, but also like medical images of how to label them. And those can like take a lot of time and money and a lot of effort. So there's other ways to go around it. And um, that's um, self-supervised learning, and that's part of the reading that you will do. So. That's great, we touched on that. So, wait, is that it? Yeah, that's it, I think. Okay, any questions? Yeah. 
I'm pretty sure um, most facial recognition software aren't just based on CNNs because um, like, well, you know, like iPhone cameras can't be unlocked with a photo of you. It will be had some sort of like 3D shape as well. So it is, um, it's kind of hard to say um, how much like CNN parameters are involved. And I don't think most uh, facial recognition softwares are like basically this, because this is very simple stuff. And a lot of the new facial recognition software probably used by Apple or whatever uh, are probably moving on from CNNs to some like vision transformers or something like that. But these are still useful for some um, easy tasks. Like I said, USPS is still using this um, image recognition for like recognizing your zip code and barcodes and so forth. So I can't answer that question directly because I'm not aware of any facial recognition software that uses this at the moment, but um, you can look into that. So, yeah. Any other questions about intuition or the neuroscience aspect of things or anything? Okay, we still have a bit more. Rotated. Okay, so that is actually um, a very good point. So images can, there are multiple um, boundaries to image recognition. So one uh, is trans, uh, trans, translation, and uh, another is rotation, which um, you talked about. And then another thing is like occlusion. So like say like I just slap on a white like block rectangle pixel on an image that excludes like the person's face and how it's like recognize that. And also like uh, distortions or um, maybe like some noise or some like color variations. Uh, and all these things, they can't really be improved with uh, model parameters. Uh, like CNN overcomes the translation invariance uh, problem, but you obviously can't try to like make a model that's um, like rotational invariant. But CNN does uh, tackle that just by training on rotated images. Like there's this technique called data augmentation that basically lets your uh, model generalize a bit better by just creating some more data sets. So like say you have like a 10 cat images, you could like make like a bunch more, like 200 more just by like artificially modifying them, like rotating them, changing some colors, adding some random pixels, covering some images like cropping. Now all these technologies um, or actually techniques that you apply to your data before you start training can actually just improve your performance when looking at these um, weird edge cases. Yeah, very good question. Yeah, so, um, well, this is very opinionated because, like, there's not really, like, a set, like, line or, like, text that someone can publish that says this is true. But um, a lot of um, artificial intelligence and deep learning uh, development came from neuroscience. And uh, that's not very, um, that's, that, like, AI didn't start with neuroscience. Like, people actually just started trying to make sense of data using, like, normal computational methods. And then they hit a blockade and they were like, oh, neuroscience kind of works. And then they implemented that and now it's going in that trend. And uh, what I would argue is that computer vision, uh, well, when people try to apply uh, deep uh, learning techniques to computer vision, they actually notice that, okay, neuroscience might be the best thing to apply here and we take some concept from here. And then that trend kind of caught up and then people are now looking into language, uh, looking into knowledge graphs or how our brain works and how human functions and try to apply that into deep learning. And so uh, if we go back to the brain analogy slide, it might be quite far back. Mm -hmm. So uh, one more. Yeah. So there's this paper by Hubo Weasel. Um, I don't know their proper names, but uh, that's a paper that's published by um, well, these people. They made it. They made an argument about how um, uh, how the visual cortex of cats work. So they showed a cat like an image of a line. And then this part of their brain activated, and they showed a cat an image of a edge, like not a full line, but like the edge of a line. Like say this is a line, they showed an image up there, and then it activated different things. And they noticed how that visual cortex is actually noticing and firing off neural uh, signals based on kind of features that you see. And then later they noticed that there's this sort of hierarchical pattern in how uh, our visual cortex recognizes images. 
So if you see this uh, right here, it goes from the I and then to the LGN, then V1, V2, V4, and I2. And then that kind of increases in complexity bit by bit. So you would maybe process some images in um, LGN, and then in V1, you will recognize, say, some super low level features here, like maybe lines and then some like maybe colors, like half, half colors. And then in the next level, you recognize more um, complex features and so forth. And that's actually how CNN works. So the intuition is that in the first layer, you might uh, try to find features like edges, like the edge of my head or the edge of my arm. And then in the next layer, after you find those features and train on those features, you can find, say, OK, these edges actually make up the face. And then in the next layer, you say, OK, this face and this eye maybe makes up, well, actually, no, this head and this face eye makes up a face, and then um, you keep on making conclusion based on that. So um, a lot of how CNN's intuition works is from uh, the brain, and it's quite a hard to mathematically prove that CNN is the best way for image recognition. Like, nobody just, like, proved that, okay, we should use com convolution. People in got inspired by neuroscience to go that way. And that's... I think that's one of the biggest breakthroughs in deep learning, and that's from computer vision. So I think that's why a lot of people argue that computer vision kind of pushed deep learning forward in like the 90, I don't know the dates, yeah, but when it started. Here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that? I have no idea, actually. <laughs> I think the, um, maybe the cat's brain is uh, larger, easier to study. Or like it's more similar in structure, because I know mice is used in a lot of like um, less like uh, intensive um, learning, like pathfinding and, and that kind of stuff. And maybe the maybe the mice's eye don't recognize as much things because I'm I think cats' eye like their vision is like comparable to that of a human. Um, instead of using like maybe mice which might have different like visual. Um, interpretation like if you use an eagle that's going to be different from a human eye <laughs> so I think the, it's just like the similarity of how perception works yeah anything else do you know <laughs> I know that the, uh, people have trained on uh, CNNs that's not like normal images, but I'm not sure that they have actually used that example specifically. But it will be a quite interesting place to explore. But um, just thinking intuitively, since we can recognize things, we should be able to make these recognize things. Like that's, I think that's like the goal we're going for after here. But maybe that is a breakthrough. You can look into it. <laughs> Anything else? I think we're almost time. Cool. Okay, that's it. That's the computer vision lecture. Hope you guys have fun. <laughs>